Mr. Palm Boss, tell me how. Hey, Mr. Palm Boss, let's do it now. Hey, Mr. Palm Boss, you're the one that makes fishing so much fun. Well, I woke up this morning and I headed for my pond. Meet Mr. Palm Boss, yeah, we're gonna chase the sun. Fired up old Spartan. Show where the living breed. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what I need to raise a big old horse. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk, the Pond Boss, checking things out with you right here from the world headquarters of Pond Boss Magazine and Bob Lusk Outdoors, just south of the shores of Lake Texoma in beautiful Gordonville, Texas. Glad you're joining us tonight. Got a pretty good show lined up. It's kind of hard to, uh, to talk about water, but then again, it's not. So uh, that's the way we're going to start off today is talking about water. So like I always do, I'm going to see if I can find this little show on my uh, laptop and then we'll crank it up. I see a bunch of people joining in. We've got 13 people going on. Dick Tabert, John Funk, Kevin Briggs looks like. Um, Fred Bingaman checking in from Brownstown, Illinois. Glad you guys are all joining up. You know, I, Talking about water, that's one of my favorite things, so I'm really jacked up about getting to talk about that a little bit. Looks like uh, Sean Lingawi is up to bat. You know, I want to remind everybody, if you don't mind, in the comments section, good gosh, Troy Todd's already got it going on. Follow his lead. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like, and please share this video to your timeline so we can grow the audience. Michael Eric's checking in from uh, Iowa. Looks like we got a good good start. We got 20 people on board already. That's good, that's 20 people we know about. I don't know how many more on that we don't know about. So, here we go. Now I've found it on my laptop. Now I do want to encourage you to uh, spend a little bit of time and throw some questions at me. Let's see here. Nope, that isn't it. I picked up the wrong one. i got to find it here. I'll bear with me just a minute. And just uh, remember, here's my first commercial, Pond Boss Magazine, $35 a year. It's a bargain for that price, and that's the economy that fuels all this stuff so we can provide all this information to you for really a low cost. So if you don't mind, subscribe to the magazine. There's a whole lot of information in it. It comes out six times a year. Uh, other resources you've got are the Pond Boss Resource Guide. This is just full of vendors that we vetted and approved that we like a lot. Uh, if you got the Ask the Boss discussion forum at pondboss.com, that's a good place to get some information as well. So, uh, and this Pond Boss Facebook page, we, we put up a whole lot of articles and good information. So now, if I can find this video, or well, we're gonna get rolling on it and just keep talking. If I can't, I'm gonna keep talking anyway, because I do wanna talk about water. I'm gonna refresh the page on my laptop because it sure is easier to uh, follow because I can see your questions a whole lot easier. Kevin Briggs says, is the most recent magazine come out? Yes, the March, April should be in your in your uh, mailbox by now. Give it another day. Fred says, does everyone know it's my birthday? Well, it looks like some of them do because there's several folks wishing me a happy birthday and I appreciate it. Oh, there it is. Here's that video. Now I can spread it out and see what everybody's saying to us. John Funk got it. John Henry got it. Okay, Pond Boss, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Chris Rigoni, greetings. Dick Tabard, happy birthday, he says. Thank you. You know, I'm 63 years old today. You know, and of course, Fred's probably sitting there laughing because he's 180, you know, and of course, he's laughing now. But, you know, I, I look at 63, and it's easy. When you're, when you're 63, you can say, ah, it's just a number. And I'd like to sit here and tell you that 63 is my favorite number, but I don't know anybody's ever said that in the history of mankind. You know, but all I know is I have a cool life, and I'm so glad that you're sharing it with me today. Matt Arrington, Colin Pearson, yeah, 63 young. Atta boy, I love the way you're thinking. Um, I'm going to scroll back down and see who all is on board so I can greet everybody. Good gosh, there's lots of folks. John Funk, cheap at 35 Actually, 35 bucks is pretty cheap to get a subscription to Pond Boss. You know, and, and with the information you get, it's timely. So it's good, good stuff. And, I mean, I took Debbie out to eat last Friday night. It cost 50 bucks, and that was without drinks. You know, so how much is it worth to get some really good information? I want to encourage you and ask you 
to uh, subscribe to Pond Boss. Tommy Davis. Hello, Tommy Davis. Glad you're up to bat. Let's see. Jim Fritchie from, uh, oh, howdy, Bob. Happy birthday. Thanks, Jim, from down in Central Texas. Let's see. Uh, I think I said, yeah, I said hello. Anthony Abate. Welcome back. Well, welcome back to you, Anthony. I hope you're not freezing to death up there in the North Country. Of course, you're kind in the North Country, but then you're not. Then you're not. Chris Rigoni on board. John Henry. Kevin Briggs, I said hello to you. Um, let's see who else we got. Scott Hol Holcomb, happy birthday. Thank you. I said Matt Arrington. Danny Tolliver from Bells, Texas. Ben Strange gives us a thumbs up. <coughs> Tori Rhodes, hope you had a good one. You know, I really did. I've had a great birthday. I've been able to do pretty much what I want to do, which was right. I spent a good part of the day today trying to wrap up the May June issue of the magazine. And uh, it'll be ready to go to print uh, to uh, to the to layout and design here in another three or four days, probably by Friday or Monday anyway. And then uh, here we go. We're gonna go. Joe Herbertson. Hey Bob, went down to the pond today and saw my first ball of bass fry. Very excited. My bass I stocked last summer are spawning. Now that's pretty darn cool. You know when when you when you understand the way fish spawn and you can walk down to the pond and see those little clouds of bass and know they're only going to be there for just a few days before they start to dissipate, that's pretty good. Anthony Abate, lakes are open around here. Four hours north, they still have 20 plus inches of ice in the north woods. I believe that. Chris Johnson, happy birthday from Bro Bridge, Louisiana. I was kind of down in that neck of the woods last week. I was down around Baton Rouge and, and um, stopped in and stopped at Billy's Boudin and got some cracklings and some Boudin balls. It was really good. Michael Gray checking in from Tennessee. You know, the what I wanted to talk about first today is water. You know, we take it for granted. You know, if we, if we were to wring ourselves out, we're probably 75% water, and then the rest of that stuff's dry weight. You know, it's just... I've written several articles. Maybe the best story, my favorite story I've ever written was about water. And it, it got almost um, philosophical and maybe even a little spiritual. But the, the thing about water that I love, God knew what he was doing when he made water, I, I got to tell you. And I just want you to submerge yourselves into the depths of this discussion about water. I think it's the most important compound in the world. You know, H2O, water. Sure, oil's a big deal, but if oil goes away, we got a transportation nightmare. If water goes away, we die. You know, the thing is, is when oil gets used, it's gone. But water recycles itself. Water has got this amazing ability to cleanse itself. You know, some of you guys are old enough to remember back in the late 60s, early 70s, where Lake Erie was the first body of water to ever catch on fire. It was so polluted. But steps were taken, and that lake was able to cleanse itself. Now, it cleansed itself a lot by dissipating much of what was in it, but it also flushed a lot of it out. You know, 70% of the earth is covered in water. 97% of that water is salty. So you can do the math on that. 20% of the world's fresh water flows over Niagara Falls. <laughs> it goes through the Great Lakes, through that chain, back up through Lake Ontario, down the St. Lawrence Waterway, and into the Atlantic Ocean. So there's a huge amount of the world's fresh water coming through the northern tier of the United States. Some of it comes down the Mississippi River. You know, so the thing about water is almost everybody that has a pond, including us, it's it kind of soothes our souls. I mean, we this last weekend, Debbie and I hosted all of our grandkids. We have nine grandchildren. Now, I don't know about you guys. When I started reproducing decades ago, I didn't think about them growing up and leaving and then coming back and bringing a whole lot more with them. But we had a ball last fr Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Several of them had not met. They got to meet, hang out with each other, and spend time. Several of them caught their first fish. And those that hadn't caught their first fish this weekend did it the last time they were at our house. Huge fun. I mean, they caught catfish. They caught bluegill. They caught bass. Even caught a rainbow trout I didn't even know was in the pond. I was talking to one of my guys and said, hey, did you put those fish in there? Oh, yeah, we had a couple left over, so threw them in the swimming pond. 
Well, we caught one of the two in a three-quarter acre swimming pond. You know, water is just astonishing to me. It, it fills our ponds and lakes, and then it leaves. Now, one thing I want you to recognize is water leaves. And it's just amazing because water is one of those compounds that it can move laterally. It goes downhill. Water follows the path of least resistance. And sometimes that's the sky. You know, I noticed, let's see who all's on here. I noticed Jennifer Mayer Young. She's from Vernon. She she really understands evaporation. I mean, in Vernon, Texas, you know, they'll probably get 26 inches of rain per year and 90 inches of evaporation. So water can leave in lots and lots and lots of ways. Happy birthday, says Jennifer. Thank you very kindly. Let's see here. I want to uh, keep looking at, at some of these comments here. Mike Snook, I've seen several of your videos. This is my first live stream. So hello, everybody. Glad Mike Snook's on board. Good question. Let's see. Tommy Davis, Brandon Belly, you ready to go fishing? Uh-oh, looks like we got friends on here. People are getting to know each other. That's a good thing. The, uh, the thing about water that I want to drive home is not only the it, that it leaves, it comes. It comes and goes. And, and our job as stewards is to take care of it. Hey, Victor Moberg, glad you're on board, buddy. You know, if you start looking about it, thinking about it, just is, is we've got a little water feature right beside our swimming pond. All I got to do is plug in a pump and there's a little waterfall. Just the sound of that soothes our souls. And that's part of what's going on with you guys. It soothes your souls just to hear the sounds of water and be around a happy pond. So taking care of your water is a big deal. I see my bride checking in, Debbie Dobbs Lusk. Hi, honey. I think it's going so okay so far. We've already busted through, good gosh, 12 minutes already. The, uh, uh, the thing about water that you need to think about is where are most of the big cities built? On a river? By a lake? Somewhere near water. Water's been the subject of celebration. It's been subject of disputes, subject of wars. I can remember a few years back when the state of Florida, I believe, was going to sue the state of Georgia, there was a giant drought, and there's a river. Not, and somebody else knows the details. I just remember it happening. I see Nate Herman from Peoria, Illinois, Herman Brothers. Dick Tabbert, water temperature is 47 degrees, no fish bite. Slow down. Don't fish so fast. <laughs> but I can remember when the state of Florida was preparing to sue the state of Georgia for water rights. Uh, to a river that borders those two states. And then it rained and the suit went away. You know, the thing about water is nobody nobody understands the value of water until you don't have it. You know, spiritually to me, being around water and you admire its resilience from a shoreline or you're wrapped in the warm summer sun and, and uh, like when we're swimming in the swimming pond and I can feel that cool layer down on my feet, just have a great appreciation for water. You know, water defies gravity. Just like I said a while ago, it evaporates. It wicks. It absorbs into soils. It. Uh, I know that three or four times in the last month, I've seen just a bank of fog rolling across our ponds when the pond temperature had risen and then we had a cold front come through. That water is just absorbing into the air like a sponge. So it goes. Now, the thing that I want you to rem remember, probably the biggest take-home point is that we borrow the water. Joe Herbertson says, that was a St. Mary's River, I live by it. Well, I hope you live on the right side. <laughs> Steve Lewis, glad to see you checking in from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Glad you're on board, buddy. You know, the, the more things about water is it accepts a lot and it rejects little. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Water absorbs a lot. It absorbs minerals, it absorbs metals. You know, there's a lot of things it won't. It won't absorb plastic. It won't absorb some metals, but it absorbs a lot of things. If you put a Volkswagen in a lake, a lot of that Volkswagen will dissolve over a span of time, whether it's, you know, 20 years or 50 years. Now, there's part of that that won't, but water's going to, to absorb and dissolve as much stuff as it possibly can. And I can remember, oh gosh, this has to be back in the, uh, the 80s. I can remember, yeah, this had to be like 87, 88 through there somewhere. I was taking some fish to go stock in a pond 
in the high plains of Texas, and there was a big, big storm front coming through. It was in May. And there was they had been in a drought, and a pond had evaporated down, and it filled up in about 45 minutes, and all the fish died. Well, as I got to thinking about it, as that pond evaporated over that span of probably three years, the only thing that left was the water. So just think about it from a mathematical standpoint. If you've got water that's got, say, 100 parts per million alkalinity, calcium carbonate, that mineral, whatever, pick one, and half the water evaporates, you've got twice the amount of mineral because that doesn't leave. It collects. As a matter of fact, when you see some ponds evaporate, there'll be a, a layer of white film around the edge of some ponds. That's limestone that's being deposited as the water drops. You know, and what happened with that pond where the fish died, I watched them die. There were two things that happened. That pond filled up in about 30 minutes. We were taking cover because the tornado sirens were going off. There were hailstones as big as golf balls, and we were in a barn. And we just, two, two of us, there were, the landowner and I, we both sat in our own trucks. And after the storm blew through, we drove down across the dam on this little pond, maybe a half acre pond, and we stopped. And the spillway was clogging up with ice, ice in May. All those golf ball sized hailstones had floated into the pond, migrated down the pond. It looked like a big giant glass of ice water. So the water temperature plummeted. The minerals and metals were diluted at least by half, maybe more than that. The pH changed and all those shocks came together and pretty soon we see fish up at the top bobbing for air, flipping over and dying. There wasn't a thing we could do about it. So water's pretty, pretty amazing, you know. The, uh, Jesus turned water into wine. So does Napa Valley. <laughs> but they do it with a little different process. You know, there's so many elements to understand about water just to help us become better pondmeisters and better stewards. We borrow it. I said that. Now, when water enters your pond, it's just... One thing, one of the take-home points tonight is that that water is only going to be there temporarily. So your job is to take care of it. You know, if you can aerate it, aerate it. Don't add too much nutrient load to it. Uh, if you do, figure out a way to get some of the nutrients out. We uh, we irrigate our lawns with from with water from one of our ponds, and then we have a well if we need to top the pond off if we don't get enough rain. So we're able to convert some nutrients from where we feed fish and where the plant life lives and dies and, you know, decomposes, we're able to pump some of that back on the, on the lawn. You know, water, scientists call it the universal solvent. And like I said earlier, that means anything that can will dissolve into the water, which is pretty fascinating. Water can become polluted and then for the most part, it can become cleansed. Now there's some things that can dissolve into water that won't come out. You know, that's some of those heavier metals that you hear about, lead, Mercury, things like that. You know, water can reach its saturation point and then some of that stuff has to come out, but some of it will stay back. That's why it's, and stay dissolved. That's why it's really important for us to be good stewards of that water. You know, the, it's really funny. We live up in the northern part of Texas and the Trinity River meanders from West Texas through several small cities, goes through Fort Worth, Texas, meanders, goes into Dallas, then goes down below, below Dallas and it's really funny because people in Fort Worth drink the water and then they clean it up the best they can with a sewage treatment plant. And then they send it to Dallas and Dallas drinks some of that, some of that water. And so other, other water that Dallas gets comes from uh, other water treatment plants and lakes upstream. Then they use it. Then they clean it up the best they can. Then they send it down to the river where Ty Cleve catches giant gar in it. And then people in Houston drink some of it. So water's got an amazing ability to cleanse itself. I remember three or four years ago, the city of Wichita Falls, Texas, were in such a severe drought that they implemented a system where they could take their own wastewater and cleanse it and purify it good enough where they can drink it. And I think that's smart. You know, water, it's, it's kind of gross if you think about it. Oh, we're going to drink water we went to the bathroom in? But I pretty well promise you that there's not a lot of water, a lot of water out there that hasn't been used for something and then we drink it. Whether it's been used to irrigate a cornfield in Iowa or to um, go through the bladder of a deer in Central Texas, that water gets recycled, gets used over and over and over again. You know, when 
when water's exposed to the atmosphere, uh, gases are allowed to escape. You know, when you walk around the edge of your pond and, and you step in some of that decomposing organic matter, that stuff is what you smell. That's gases that have been dissolved into the water, <coughs> decomposed, and now they escape. They're going out the water. You know, it's, it's nutrients are recycled. Uh, new compounds are dissolved. When water is exposed to the atmosphere, to the riparian and area and aquatic plants, it takes up a lot of those nutrients and converts them to plants or converts them to fish. You know, for example, some fish are grazers. Some fish, grass carp, for example, they'll eat plants. Tilapia, where they're legal, they eat algae. So they take the nutrients that were once dissolved in the water that grew into plants, and they start taking that nutrient load out of the water to convert it to some other kind of mass. You know, there's some interesting things <clears throat> about water. Um, if you have a willow tree by your pond, a mature willow tree in the summer can transpire 100 gallons of water a day. It can take it up through the roots, absorb it, and then transpire it through the leaves into the atmosphere, 100 gallons a day. You know, and that goes into the atmosphere on the summer, 100 gallons. So if you've got 100 willow trees, they're going to use up a fair amount of water. Here's a few more interesting facts about water I think you'll enjoy. If you think about this, if you weigh water at its most dense point, 39 degrees is it. A, a 39 degree, if you have a gallon jug of water and you weigh it, it weighs more than water at any other temperature. As water warms up, it expands. As water cools down from 39, it expands. You know, used to, not knowing anything about all this, I, I wondered how ponds in the north kept from freezing solid and killing all the fish. Well, it's, it's pretty simple because... When ice starts to form on the lakes in the northern part of the country, or, or anywhere where ice forms, the water beneath that ice has to be warmer than 32 degrees, or it would be ice. So if you think about it, water at 39 degrees being the heaviest, it sinks. So that 32 degrees has to penetrate all the way down as far as it can. That's why you have ice at 18 inches sometimes, or 6 inches sometimes, depending on where you are, or like where we are here we might get a skim of ice, but not much. The water below that is always warmer, or it would be ice. You know, if you think about it as well, the water's affinity for oxygen increases as the temperature goes down. So water's ability to hold oxygen is at its highest point at about 33, 34 degrees. But the warmer it gets, its affinity for oxygen begins to diminish. So cool water is good water for absorbing oxygen. Now, very rarely is water saturated at 100% with oxygen. It may be 85%. You know, that's why trout can't live in water warmer than 70 degrees. It's not because that water's too hot. It's because they need more oxygen than what water can literally hold at 70 degrees. So that's why trout start to perish at 70 degrees, or at least rainbows do. You know, there's uh, some other mysteries and I think they're kind of ironic, you know, water in, in our part of the country, even Alabama, water temperature is going to be colder in the wintertime than it is in Minnesota. You know, in Minnesota, water on the bottom of a pond there might be 40 degrees, but in Alabama, after an Arctic front snaps through there, water temperature top to bottom of a pond might be 33 to 35 degrees. So it's, I think there's some irony in that. You know, and then at this time of year, as the sun penetrates the water and begins to heat it, heat wants to rise at that point. So as water gets warmer, that heat wants to try to escape. So when you've got sunlight bearing down on the pond and you've got wind blowing across it, that's where you're going to figure out, that's when you're going to figure out how your thermocline forms. Because that heat can only push down so far. And then it wants to rise and escape. So you end up with a layer cake effect where you have a warm layer of water sitting on top of a cold layer of water. And the defining line between those two is called the thermocline. And that warm water on the top could be 8 to 10 degrees warmer than the water on the bottom. Now the thickness of that thermocline, it may be a few inches. It could be, it could be several feet. I've seen the thermocline be 10 feet thick in, in, in ponds in upstate New York, for example, where... A uh, trout can live all winter, I mean, all summer long. It's pretty cool. Stratification, that's what we call that, the thermocline and the two layers. 
Let me see here. I want to look around and see who else is on here. Tommy Davis always wondered how far south could survive all, all year. I'll tell you, here's a pretty cool story. Uh, I've got one client that's a little bit eccentric, to say the least, and he wanted to, to do a test. I, I made that comment to him one day. I said, his name is Ron Morgan. I said, hey, Ron, he's in Crescent, Texas. I said, Ron, you know, 70 degrees isn't what killed trout. He says, all baloney. I've been fishing for trout my whole life. They die at 70. I said, well, let's just make a little bet. He says, what do you want to bet? I said, let's see if we can keep them alive and inject oxygen. So we rented a, a, a big cylinder of oxygen, one of those liquid cylinders, fabricated a, a manifold to put in the bottom. He's got, he's got a stream where he pumps water out of a creek that he's flowing, which is a long story. I'll save that for another day. And then he would uh, have a pool that's built above ground with a liner in it. It's about six feet deep. So he'd flow water into that, still does it, and the water will flow through and go out and empty in the creek. So we made a little manifold and diffuser and put it in the bottom of his trout stream and started pumping pure oxygen in there. We kept those trout alive, no kidding, until the water temperature hit 83 degrees. And they were panting like dogs, you know, but it, it, we were able to inject and super saturate enough oxygen to satiate their needs to breathe. But when 83 degrees hit, they died. So it didn't matter how much oxygen then, 83 was it. And he had a trout feast two or three days later. Andy Tolliver says, any suggestions on what to build to allow cattle to have access to water, but to keep them from tearing the bank up and mucking up the water? Yes, there is. I tell you what a lot of, what a lot of guys do, Danny, is um, they'll fence off the pond and then run a siphon pipe through the through the dam, just just slightly below the water level. Now you can do that without letting water out. And then you and when you fill that uh, siphon pipe, you, at the bottom you've got a hose that goes over into a fish tank with a float on it, just like when I say fish tank, I mean stock tank, an aluminum stock tank, rock, concrete, whatever you got. It's got a float in it, kind of like a toilet. And when the water level drops, it opens up that siphon and siphons more water in there for, for cattle to drink. The other choice is to fence them off all the pond except one place they can access. That's one way to do that. Nate Herman, it's all I can eat fried chicken night at Tracy's in Norris, Illinois, but I'm glad to catch a few minutes. <laughs> you have to love Nate Herman. We're going to get him on as a guest here before long. He's a, he's a huge amount of fun. Looks like we got uh, Carmen Martinez McCabe, my wife's dear friend. Matt Rail checking in from Indiana. Trana Madonna Smith checking in from the Dallas area, I expect. Matt Willis. Hey, it's your birthday today too, buddy. Matt Arrington. Marta Howell. Matt Arrington says, does hay bales help clear the water? That's advice I got from an old timer. You know, old timers pretty much pitch that advice out there. But I'm going to tell you that uh, it's a it's a... It's a hit or miss thing. It depends on why water's muddy. Here, here's what I'm going to tell you about that. Water typically water gets muddy because of suspended clay particles. Now we, you know, you hear us preach all the time. We need clay to make sure a pond holds water really, really well. Now it depends on the size, and, and the reason we use clay is because it's compactable. The reason it's compactable is because the molecules are so small. Think, think sand. Think beach sand. You know, that gritty, grainy stuff, you can't compact that because the particles are too big. But clay is so tight, it can be packed in with some moisture. Well, that's the good news. The bad news is some of those particles can be so small that they'll suspend in the water column. When that happens, you, a lot of times you got to give them a nudge. Now, the theory behind using hay to do that is the hay, in the right circumstance, can, can collect those clay particles and actually almost act like a magnet. To make them clean together. As a matter of fact, I just wrote a story today that'll be in the May-June issue of Pond Boss Magazine. Remember that thing? Pond Boss Magazine. $35 a year. While we're here, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Click like and share this video broadcast to your uh, news feed if you don't mind. But there's several ways to clear up a muddy pond. The first thing I would try to figure out is why is it muddy? And if the source is because there's disturbed soils, Vegetate the dirt, because if you don't vegetate the dirt, you could probably expect that even if you get it clear, it's going to happen again. So the problem is that there's a source, and if you can alleviate the source, then you can eliminate the problem. What we'll do typically with my Bob Lusk Outdoors group is we will figure out there are some polymers out there. We can use gypsum. We can use aluminum sulfate. 
But I tell you, you got to be careful about using aluminum sulfate. You can kill your fish with that. So there's ways to do that. Oh my gosh, Mary Lanehart's checking in from upstate New York. Oh gosh, you pantyhose, pantyhose and tuna fish. There's a story I'll share with you one of these days. Happy birthday. Thank you very kindly, honey. The uh, clear and muddy waters, I think if I was going to give you the best advice is get a, a, get a glass jar, a pickle jar, you know, one gallon, fill it full of that water, set it on a shelf in the garage, you go look at it in four or five days. If you see a layer of, of sandy silt on the bottom of that jar, and the water clarity is increasing, then it might settle out on its own. You know, typically I tell people to try to figure out how to let it settle out on its own, and if it doesn't, then give it a nudge using gypsum. Or and what the gypsum does is is it kind of trades places with the clay. That clay is is suspended in the water because it's lighter than water, or it has a magnetic charge that makes it stick. I'm still laughing about Mary Lane Hart's comment. Okay, I got to share that story with you one of these days. Let's see what else we got going on here. Mark Wyman, another upstate New York. Hey, Mark, glad to see you, buddy. Glad you're there. The uh, other parts about water that I think is important to know is, you know, I was talking about water layering. So you've got that warm layer of water sitting on top of a cold layer of water. Everybody's heard the term turnover. Well, typically turnovers happen... As that warm layer of water begins to cool down and it reaches the temperature of this cool layer, and as this cools to the same temperature, they mix. Now here's what's really interesting, is during the summer months when you've got that warm stratified layer sitting on top of that lower cooler layer, that cool layer is going to run out of oxygen pretty quick. Water can only get oxygen from two sources. One is contacting the atmosphere. And two is via photosynthesis from plants. So those two things can, can is what supplies oxygen to the water column. So, if, so when you have this water layer of water segregated under the thermocline sitting down there, and it's not contacting the atmosphere and it has no plants in it, then it's going to run out of oxygen. So the big problem with the turnover is when those two layers mix in this anoxic water mixes with this fertile, happy, living water above, That then you can see the oxygen levels plummet. And there's been fish kills due to turnover because when the water turns over, it can kill an active plankton bloom, which increases the oxygen demand from that decaying, dying plankton. I'm going to drink of water here. So there you go, turnover. I've seen turnovers happen in the winter, seen them happen in the summer. You know, and because of turnover, and in today's strategies that people are using to manage ponds, aeration has become a big deal. There's my daughter, Lindsay, checking in. Happy birthday, Daddy. Thanks, honey. Where's my cake? Oh, wait, we had a cake and ate it, too, last weekend, didn't we, with all the grandkids? That was really fun. Fred Bingaman, Nate Herman, listening to Lusk is better than anybody's fried chicken. Atta boy, you get him, baby. Jessica Frost checking in from uh, Alabama. Tell those grandkids I miss them, I love them, hello. You know, um, let's see, I thought I saw Matt Rail. Happy birthday, Pond Wise Man. Well, that's awful kind of you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Dick Tabert, best of both worlds, eating chicken and watching the Pond Boss. Man, I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing. <laughs> let's see, I'm, I'm going to go back through here and look at some more of these factoids about water because I've got a little list here. I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. You know, just aeration, let me take a minute and talk about that. Aeration really started coming onto the scene probably 20, 25 years ago, and it really came over from uh, uh, the wastewater treatment business. And the, the premise behind aeration, there's really three or four ways to aerate a pond. You know, there are fountains but most of those fountains are mostly for beauty because they don't draft deep enough to destratify a lake. There, um, there are water circulators, which I think are pretty cool, where water can be, you can take water in a pond and move it horizontally like the current of a river. But by far the most used and most successful aeration systems are bottom diffuse systems. 
Now, we've got a whole lot of vendors that do aeration systems. Matter of fact, Matt Rail, I mean, he, he's made a living designing aeration systems. So he can be the first one to chime in and tell you we've got a number of sponsors, uh, Vertex, Casco Marine, a bunch of them that manufacture uh, stuff, uh, manufacture aeration. I've just got distracted. Marta said, I didn't get cake. Well, make one and let's eat it in a little bit. Come on over. <laughs> uh, but the bottom diffused aeration, it's a little bit misunderstood, I think, by a lot of people because what it is is it's a high volume, low pressure um, air compressor pushing water through a diffuser to create bubbles that cascade through the water column that looks almost like Alka-Seltzer for those of you who know, know what that is, uh, which includes me. But what that does is people think that those diffusers actually aerate the water, but they don't. What they do is they create vertical currents. And if you think about water, nature's job is when, when heat hits it, it pushes it down, but the only way that, that the heat can go down is if something circulates it down. But when you start thinking about wave action, you know, waves blowing across the pond, those waves hit the shore and turn under. So they don't go down very far. So what bottom diffused aeration does is it allows the water to be pushed from the bottom up, almost like a mushroom, where that water can come up and turn and boil and move and come up and hit the surface. Matter of fact, when you start up an aeration system that you've had, you start it up in the spring time, uh, manufacturers tell you, don't turn it on and leave it on. Turn it on, leave it on 15 minutes, and then turn it off. The next day, leave it 30. The next day, leave it an hour and double it every day to, to kind of get a startup so you can... So you don't take anything, any gases or any diffused, you know, sulfur or whatever's in the water below the surface and shove it up to the top and cause a problem with it. Because uh, if you take that, take some of those bottom gases and dump them into the top of the pond, you could kill some fish. So what it does is aeration moves the water enough to allow gases to dissipate, allows water to contact, contact the atmosphere to absorb oxygen and do what the magic of water does. I see some more questions popping up. Let me see what's going on here. Scott Serio joined up here. Tom Davis, another Tom Davis from Ohio. Good to see him. Dave Glover from, uh, I believe Dave's from Illinois, Dimictic Lakes. Hey, we're going to throw a little science in there. Love it. Mark Wyman, many of the BCP, what's, uh, let me think of what BCP is. That's an acronym for... Something, I don't remember what that is. Died, starved over the winter, paper thin, but the perch are fat and happy. BCP, black crappie, black crappie. <laughs> I'm a fish guy, I should know that. Uh, paper thin, but the perch are fat and happy. Look like the perch outcompete them. You know what? That's very likely because perch, yellow perch operate better in cooler water than crappie do. Crappie don't like cool water. Dave Glover, I think the depth and thermal refuge is pretty important for growing big bass. Any recommendations? Are you, you know what? I'm going to tell you something, Dave. I hadn't thought about that until just a few years ago. I think that thermal refuge is huge. We've got one lake under management in particular that's a 10-acre lake, and that landowner decided he wanted to, to buy an aeration system. So he called some people and bought one, and he liked it so much he bought another one. So he doubled it. Well, as we stocked the lake and started to manage the lake, started looking, those two systems didn't keep oxygen saturation above 85%. So we were looking at some water in the summertime in Texas, outside of Fort Worth, Texas, that was in the upper 80s, like 87, 88 degrees. And he called me one day, he said, man, I got a few fish dying. And it was some of his bigger, bigger bass. Now it wasn't killing bluegills, wasn't killing small bass. It was killing, and it wasn't many, you know, 10 or 15. So at that point I said, you know what, let's take some temperatures. I want, I, want, I want temperatures from top to bottom. And I want to do that for a week. And I want you to text it to me in the morning and the afternoon. His water temperature was autonomous, 87 degrees, top to bottom. So what I had him do was turn off both aeration systems and then put one of them on a timer where it came on at 9 o'clock at night and went off at 9 in the morning. The water temperature dropped 6 degrees within about 10 days and the fish kill stopped. So each subsequent year from that, that's how we do that aeration system because we gotta have some thermal refuge. If you don't have thermal refuge, I, I think that's a big, big deal. God didn't invent thermoclines for us to really mess with them. So I do believe that thermal refuge is a big, big deal. Lance Faber, Bob, the cattle were fed in a field near the big pond this last winter. 
I assume the nutrients from the hay and cattle waste will stimulate a bloom, which is beneficial to fish fry. I also assume it will grow more algae, which will be cleaned up by the tilapia. Is there a downside I'm not thinking about? Yes, there is a downside that you're not thinking about. How much is enough? You know, I'm working on a lake right now where it's, it's in South Louisiana and birds roost there by the thousands. That lake is so fertile and they don't have any control over the volume of waste that comes into that pond. And it's killing fish. You know, so I'm not going to be an alarmist here, but what I'm going to tell you is that if you were going to fertilize your pond on purpose, you wouldn't go take, you know, 10, 50 pound bags of fertilizer and dump them in there. But we're just presuming that the runoff from the pastures are going to fertilize the pond, which they will. But the biggest drawback is you don't have any control over the volume. I understand what you're saying is because, you know, what, what we're wanting is, is for some to grow and we want some to, you know, the nutrients to, to create a plankton bloom and to create algae and the tilapia can eat it. As long as they can eat it faster than it's being produced or as fast as it's being produced, then you won't have a huge issue. But then again, you could. I see Todd Watts checking in from Hurricane West Virginia. Remember, everybody... Pond Boss, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Todd just did it. Click like, share the video, subscribe to Pond Boss, $35 a year. Oh, by the way, when you hashtag Pond Boss Magazine and you click like and you share it, you're entered for a drawing for a Pond Boss cap. Who doesn't want one of those? Raise your hand. And a coffee mug or a tea mug or whiskey mug. <laughs> you know, and which allow me to... Tell you our winner last week was Scott Lindsay. Congratulations, Scott. As long as we've got your address, that's going to be going out. Timothy Phillips checked in. Let me, let me see if there's any more topics that I've got written down here to talk about water. Okay, here's a paragraph that I've got that I think they're real, real important to talk about. Almost in every case, there are water quality issues where too much of the wrong things are temporarily dissolved into the water. And the water rebels. Okay, like like we were just talking about with the uh, the case of the cattle grazing, if you get too much fertility in the water, especially in a hot organic fertilizer, hot meaning not composted, not broken down into its basics. When you when you put that hot fertilizer into a pond, you're very likely to have an imbalance of nutrients that lean toward algae you may not like, like blue green algae, for example. There's a real good story coming up in the May-June issue of Pond Boss about blue-green algae, you're gonna to wanna to read that. If you don't subscribe, please do, because that, that story right there can save your pond. If you've got any issues with, or any potential issues with blue-green algae. So that's a big, big deal. You know, now the thing about it is when, when I say water rebels, when too much of something gets dissolved into the water, nature wants to use it, whether it's minerals, metals, or nutrients. Something wants to take that up. Something wants to grow and utilize it. You know, and that's part of the way water cleanses itself. You know, people build dams to impound water and you design spillways to offer the orderly release of excess water. People design habitat inside the confines of ponds and lakes so the water can do its best job. That's one of the things I love. Here's, one, here's something that this... I didn't, this didn't dawn on me until I started using mossback fish attractors. Those mossback fish attractors, not only do they give vertical structure and habitat for fish, they've got, the limbs are V-shaped, almost like an angle iron, except they're plastic. So as plankton or dust or whatever settles out of the water, a lot of that settles in to, the, to those Vs, and then pretty soon, paraphyton starts to grow. So now we're utilizing nutrients in the water column that otherwise would migrate to the bottom and maybe get used, maybe not. And that paraphyton plays a significant role to break down and decompose organic waste and help replenish the water with oxygen, replenish the water with its ability to grow more stuff that we actually like. I see Stephen Barden checking in. Hi, Stephen. Glad you're on board, man. I'm really proud of you, buddy, for what you're doing there at uh, Tarleton State, teaching fisheries classes, working with young people. If you guys don't know Texas Pro Lake Management, you need to check in and let Stephen know what's going on. My husband wants to know if he can buy a hat, Marta says. Yeah, double the price for your husband. Tell him he can have all he wants. <laughs> 
Yes, he can he can buy a hat. It's a pretty cool hat. Look at this. One size fits all. Pond boss. And a mug. You bet. Pond boss store or if you know somebody at the office, you might be able to get one there. You know, the thing about water that I kind of want to wrap up with and then switch gears is water is so resilient that it can cleanse itself. Our jobs are to give it the opportunity to do that. So I, I, I want to continue and uh, encourage everybody to be good stewards, stewards of your water so we can do our part to help it keep itself clean and keep it going. Let's see here. We got, um, are there any other questions? If not, I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about, let's see here. We got Nathan Grigsby says, go Texans. Is it that season? Where are you? You're on the wrong podcast or webcast, buddy. Go Texans. I'm all over that. Let me go scroll back here and make sure I haven't missed any, any questions. <laughs> Look at it. Mary Lane Hart's post again. That's a uh, that's a pretty cool story. Yeah, I keep talking about it. I need to share it. I'll do that next week if I remember. Let's talk about some of the finer things of um, of the food chain. Let's see. Timothy Phillips. Phillips. Will getting other plants growing help control algae? Stephen Barton. Happy birthday. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate that. Um. Will getting other plants growing help control algae? I'm going to say to a certain extent it will because the way plants work, plants really need three things to be able to thrive. They need food, they need sunlight, and they need the right temperature. When those three things come together, something's going to grow. Each different species of plants has a little bit different window of opportunity. Ah, Tarleton Texans, okay. Who knew that? I'm an Aggie. Giggle. Danny Tolliver says, Tarleton, Texas. There we go. I got it. All right. Stephen Barton knew that. He could have told me. There we go. Nathan's chiming back in. The Tarleton State, Texas. Well, you know what? We got Professor Stephen Barton on board. You guys, if you haven't connected, you need to. The uh, the thing about plants is some plants can outcompete algae. And in fact, they do. You know, algae may start off in cooler water temperatures, but normally, which I don't know why I use that word talking about ponds and lakes because there's not a lot of things that are normal anymore. Normally, algaes will start to grow in cooler water and then as the other plants begin to grow, bushy pond weed, um, valisneria, eelgrass, American pond weed, even some of the ones we don't like, like Eurasian water milfoil, as those start, things start to grow, the algae dissipates. And it's just a conversion. It's kind of like uh, this has the best opportunity until this starts to grow and this cannot compete it. So to answer your question, getting other plants growing can help control algae. Now some algae you want. Some of the single cell algae you want. Some of the paraphytic algae you want. If you've got substrates like the mossback fish habitat or you have rocks or even if you have woody structure, paraphyton can grow on that and that can help minimize algae to some extent. The algae we don't like, you know, the filamentous algae. We got about 12 minutes left, so I wanted to, to kind of change directions and talk a little bit about some of the finer aspects of the food chain. You know, depending on where you are, you guys in upstate New York, Michigan, Minnesota, you know, in the south, bluegill are the backbone of the food chain for largemouth bass. But there where you are, they're, they're more of a nuisance. You know, bluegill have a tendency to overpopulate because they don't reproduce enough to, su to sustain bass, and bass, they grow so fast, bass can't eat them. You know, so the food chain has a tendency to be more geographical or more regional, and I'm a big, big fan of having food chain, you know, pre uh, prey fish, fathead minnows, golden shiners, bluegill, pumpkin seeds, red ear, you know, even uh, even green sunfish in some weird places, uh, threadfin shad, gizzard shad, different forage species work best in different circumstances. So one thing I would encourage everybody to do is to uh, understand the niches that the different forage fish live in and their goal. Think about your fish like you think about tools in the toolbox. You're not going to use a hammer to take a tire off a car. 
That was pretty profound, wasn't it? But look at those fish that same way. I see uh, my nephew Garrett Garner. Hey, Garrett. Billy Burch from down in Southeast Texas is on board. The, uh, the thing about the food chain is some of the finer nuances <coughs> is, is the more you learn about how those fish live, how they eat, how they reproduce, how often, what their substrates are. Bluegill make beds, red ear make beds, do crappie. Does anybody know how crappie spawn? What about threadfin shad? What about gizzard shad? You know why they call a gizzard shad a gizzard shad? It has a gizzard. It's a bottom feeder. So a gizzard shad sucks stuff off the bottom of the pond, so it needs shallow, muddy areas in order to thrive. And when a gizzard shad lays its eggs, it, lay, it might lay a quarter to a half a million at a time, spew them out, some of them get fertilized, and then most parents wish them luck, go back to the mud, and they eat. You know, threadfin shad, on the other hand, they spawn every 45 to 60 days where they can live. So they're going to be reproducing more often, laying fewer eggs. They stick their eggs to grass. So if you've got threadfin shad, you don't have a substrate for them to spawn on, survival rates are going to be low, or they may not even spawn. So some of the finer things about forage fish populations is the predator fish that you're managing for really have specific needs and desires. I don't want to use that word because they can't think. But they have specific requirements. Like say a, a, um, a three-pound smallmouth bass feeds completely different than a two-pound largemouth bass. So if you understand the needs of your predator fish and then use the best prey fish for those fish, you're going to have much, much better success. I see Jim Liner checking in from Montgomery, Alabama. Hi, Jim. Working on some dates to come see you and work on the lakes over there. Once we get that ironed out, we'll, we'll, we'll hop in the boat and drive it over that way. Um, forage fish, you know, bluegills, for example, they can begin to reproduce when they're two and a half inches long. That means that a fish that was spawned in February of this year in central Texas can be laying eggs in July of this year. So that fish plays a different role than a bluegill that's hatched in October because that one may not be able to reproduce until the following April. So those are some of the little tidbits that you need to learn. M.O. Liner, Jim Liner, hey brother, happy birthday, old man. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, thank, you know, it's, it's, I've had a really warm welcome tonight for my birthday. I think I'll go home and, and uh, see what Debbie's got in mind for dinner tonight. I bet she's got a steak on her mind. I know I do. The um, other, some of the finer points, you know, it's, it's really easy to come up with a stocking plan. What's hard is to come up with a management plan. You know, you got to think about what, and, and, and every pond is different. You got to think about what your pond will let you do. The water clarity determines that. The habitat determines that. The species of fish determine that. Your timing of stocking determines that. Now, what you can do to kind of hedge your bets is some of these forage fish will eat fish food. You can expedite growth rates in small waters and get your fish to mature quicker and increase their fecundity, increase their ability to spawn with better nutrition. Now, if you don't want to feed them, stock lighter numbers and be sure that you have the kind of habitat that can provide the food for those forage fish. So keep in mind that this food, food web thing starts at the very bottom. And it can literally start at the bottom of the pond or it can start at the bottom of the food chain by things that are dissolved in the water. So as these microscopic plants and animals dissolved in the water at the right time, if they're there, when those newly hatched fry of whatever species is there, have them to eat, then your survival rates are going to go up. If you have higher survival rates, then you're going to have more bait fish. You know, talking about Jim Liner a while ago, he's managed uh, Ray Scott's lakes for a long, long time over south of Montgomery, Alabama, the President's Lake in particular. That's probably the most perpetual fertile lake I've ever seen. Now, uh, Ray recently sold his place and Jim is still there helping manage the lakes. Well, one of the things he's got to pay attention to is when you've got water that is perpetually fertile all year long and you've got some of the best bass habitat in the world, 
what you might be lacking is habitat for survival rates of some of those small fish. Well, what happens in that lake and with the high levels of, of fertility is when you can, when you can, here's a question. I'm going to pitch this out there and I'll be quiet for one second. When you've got fertile water and baby fish that can eat in that fertile water, you end up with a whole bunch of baby fish. What do you think happens to those baby fish in pretty short order in a real fertile lake if they don't have escape cover? That's right. They get eaten. Well, they get eaten by small small predator, predator fish. In this case, uh, the President's Lake is notorious for growing just oodles and gobs. Is that a word or two words? Of 12 to 14 inch bass. It grows a lot of two to four inch bass. I mean, uh, 12 to 14 inch bass. And then what happens is they're, they're forced to uh, begin to cull a bunch of those fish. Now, the, that's the bad news. They got a lot of culling to do. And with a 55 acre lake, if you're taking 30 bass per acre, you're taking 1,500 plus bass out every year, you know, which makes good ceviche and has a good fish fry. Now, the good news is, is once you get enough bass up at that three and a quarter to three and a half pound size class, where their mouth is just the right size to feed on 10 to 12 inch bass, those fish explode, explode in growth. They get huge, they get big fast. And that's one of the reasons President's Lake is notorious for growing a bunch of six pound up bass. I think you might type this in, Jim. I think the lake record was caught by Rick Clun some years ago when it was knocking on the door of, seemed like it was 13 and a half pounds. Type that in there so everybody can see it there, Jim. Jim says his water temperature is 65 and they're starting to spawn. He's caught 20 fish over six pounds in the last month. And I'm presuming most of those fish over six pounds are in the President's Lake. Now, here's one of the finer points about the food chain. A six pound bass can eat another bass that's 14 inches long. It can also eat a pound and a half gizzard shad. The President's Lake is blessed or cursed blessed with a lot of shallow water and in that shallow water gizzard shad thrive and it's muddy and that's part of the reason this lake stays fertile because those gizzard shad keep the nutrients churning and turning in there jim says starting to pull bass out under yeah starting to pull all bass out under yeah you need to be doing that in that lake because that lake is so fertile that it, it is just a a factory for small bass which is a good thing you know, because you got to have recruitment in order to grow the big bass. But if you don't control their numbers, then you're not going to see the growth rates that you want. What was the biggest bass? That, what was that big bass that Rick Clung caught that time, Jim? Type that in there for me real quick if you're listening. But I think it's something over 13 pounds, 13 and a half pounds. Might be bigger than that. I don't remember. Well, listen, it's been a joy tonight. Uh, please let everybody know. Tell your friends. Subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. Don't forget the resource guide. If you need a copy of that, let us know. We got all kinds of information. We are in the information business. Perfect Pond, want one? If you guys, anybody, if you know somebody shopping for land or need to do some due diligence on what it takes to, to build a pond and get ready to stock it, that's a good book. Mike Otto's book, Just Add Water, that's pretty much a compilation of his last 40 years worth of, of experience. And man, that guy's got some experience. So, Dave says, happy birthday. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate all the well wishes. And uh, so happy to be here. Tune in next week. And you know what? If you guys, if, if you got any topic suggestions, throw them at me because this is for you. You know, I, I want you guys to go away with, with information you can use. So, uh, this may be the 10th or 12th one we've done. I'll get in touch with Nate Herman. So, if he'd like to be a guest, we'll talk about what's going on up there in Peoria, Illinois. But if you guys have got some topic ideas, let me know about it. Leanne Holtzbauer from up there in Nebraska or Iowa. Happy birthday. Great show tonight. Thank you very kindly. Glad you joined in. And we will check in with you guys next week, next Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30, right here on the Pond Boss Facebook page. Good night, everybody. <laughs>